Hallelujah! He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, welcome to the second part of our uh, message on the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Hope you got to see part one. Um, if not, it'll probably be available on YouTube shortly. Um, so you can watch there or you can watch on um, Berkshire Community Television uh, website. Well, let's get right started here. What we've been doing is talking about how Jesus changed lives of the people to whom he appeared. Uh, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, when he rose from the dead, he went out and he interacted with different people. And last week we looked at example for Mary Magdalene and Peter and, and uh, I forget who well, the third one was we did last week, but um, anyhow, um, oh, I know it was the disciples with Thomas being absent. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little old here. But today we want to look at four more appearances of Jesus and how lives were changed by those appearances. We'll do just like we did last time. So the first is um, from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 32. And this is the appearance to Cleopas and his wife. We think it was his wife. It's not specifically said. Um, but Cleopas and one other believer, which we think was his wife, Mary, uh, still another Mary. And um, we're going to look, first of all, uh, at the events and then the emphasis and the example, as we did last week, with each appearance of Jesus. So uh, first of all, I want to read this portion of scripture. It's a really glorious story. So uh, let me just read Luke chapter 24, 13 to 32. And behold, on that very day, two of them were walking to a village called Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Similar to perhaps what happened with Mary to Magdalene, if you remember from last week. And he said to them, what are those words that you were exchanging with one another as you were walking? And they came to a stop and looking very sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happened here in these last few days? And he said to them, Jesus said to them, What sort of things? And they said to him, About Jesus the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And set, indeed, besides all this, it is the third day now since these things happened. But also some women among us left us bewildered, when they were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body, they came saying that they also had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Wow. And so many of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, You foolish men, <laughs> slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to come into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going. And he gave them the impression that he was going farther. And so they strongly urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening. And the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them that he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it, giving to them, giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him 
and he vanished from their sight. Remember, in Jesus' resurrection body, it was a real visible body, but it wasn't bound by space and time. Remember last week, we looked at him going through a locked door. Well, here he just vanishes after he reveals himself in the breaking of bread. Then one said to another, were not our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So this occurred late. The events are late Sunday afternoon, Easter, Resurrection Day afternoon. And um, they, these guys, uh, perhaps Cleopas' his wife, perhaps Cleopas and another disciple were not told, but they were walking along the road. They were sad. They were confused, but they were still meditating and hopeful. They were seeking to believe. Um, and they were discussing the horrible events of the previous days. And all of a sudden, Jesus, the resurrected Christ, the one who suffered all those horrible things, is right in their midst. And they didn't recognize him. Jesus um, did not, rec they didn't recognize Jesus probably again because the Bible says here that their eyes were closed, their eyes were blinded. Uh, they were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus begins to teach the Old Testament scripture all the way back to Genesis. And he um, is opening the scripture to them, the scriptures that pertain to him. So he's talking about the prophecies and the pictures of himself in the Old Testament scriptures, which, of course, is all they had at, the, at that time. And so uh, they ask him to stay. <clears throat> and as we read, he reveals himself to them in the breaking of bread. Something to think about how important the communion service is, because the Lord does speak to us through the uh, observance of the Lord's Supper, uh, just as he did here. And so then the emphasis here is revelation. And I want to tell us all today, myself included, to those who seek, to those who meditate, to those who thirst for knowledge, to those that want answers, God reveals himself. The Lord Jesus reveals himself if we want knowledge of him, if we want answers, if we want to seek to grow in him, he will reveal himself to us, just as he did to the Emmaus disciples. To those who want to know, and I hope you're in that category, to those who want to know, to those who are really looking for the truth, Jesus reveals himself as he has to many of us. I'm not talking about a visible revelation, I'm talking about a spiritual revelation. If we want to know, the Lord will reveal himself to us spiritually. So there's an example here for us, as we've seen with all the appearances, and that is that you and I need to search. You and I need to have open minds and open hearts so that the Lord can speak to us. And one of the things that we're seeing today that just breaks my heart, that is so tragic, is people don't want to hear. People don't have an open mind when it comes to the gospel. They cancel it out. They go, yeah, 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 I'm not listening. But yet... Um, across the world today and in the United States, but there are still hundreds of thousands of people coming to know Christ as Savior. And I'm, I'm rejoicing about that. But many, many people in our culture just cancel it out. They don't want to hear it. They're not seeking for knowledge. They're not seeking for the truth. In fact, there are many people, as all of you probably know, there are many people today that don't believe in absolute truth. Well, this is absolute truth, and that's the only place that it's found. So if we, <clears throat> if we have open minds and searching hearts, we will find the Lord, and um, we will experience the truth of the risen Christ. And the living Lord will reveal himself in us in a powerful way if we truly seek him. So to summarize this first section, Jesus died and rose to give new life to those who seek him. He rose to give new life to those who seek him. So I hope you are seeking him if you've not already done so. Then the second appearance we want to look at today, we're just going to spend a moment on, and that's because we uh, are going to review one of the ones we did last week, the da, the one I forgot, and that was the appearance to the ten disciples. Now remember, Judas was already dead, and for whatever reason, we're not told, Thomas was absent. So 
We saw last week that Jesus appeared to the ten disciples, uh, walked through a locked door, um, showed him the wounds, and um, breathed upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Um, from, and, and we saw that Christ rose, he died, and then he rose to give new life to those who were fearful and confused and uncertain, because that's how, that was the state of the disciples at that particular time. They were fearful, they were confused, they were uncertain, um, they were afraid that they were going to be um, captured by the Romans, and so on. Um, but the reason I'm reviewing that one right now is because now we're going to move to his appearance to Thomas. Remember, Thomas wasn't there. We don't know why. But when they told him later, hey, the Lord was with us and stuff. Remember what Thomas said? Thomas said, hey, I'm not going to believe until I can put my fingers in his hands and his side. So uh, unfortunately, Thomas was then, um, not then, but ever since, he's been kind of known as Doubting Thomas because he didn't believe what they said when they said that they saw the Lord. So this appearance to Thomas, remember now, this will be to Thomas and the other ten disciples. We find it in John chapter 20, verses 26 through 31, and it's a short passage. I'm going to read it, 26 through 31. So you can see what happened here. And it says eight days later, this was after the disciples had told Thomas what happened and he doubted. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside. And this time Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors again shut, locked. Jesus passed through as he had before. And he stood in their midst and he said, peace be to you. And he went right to Thomas and he said, Thomas, place your finger here. See my hands, take your hand, put it into my side, and do not continue in disbelief, but to believe, a, but be a believer. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Thomas believed. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you now believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. And so then many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, John says, the Gospel of John, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life in his name. And that's why we're here on Until Ministries, that you will believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that you'll believe that he died on the cross for your sin, that you'll believe that he glorious rose from the, uh, raised from the dead, and that in that belief and taking him as your Lord and Savior, you will have eternal life. So let's look at this uh, interesting event um, with Thomas. So the others had told him, but he wouldn't, he said he wouldn't believe until he could touch the wounds. A week passes. Thomas is still vehement and doubting. And so watch what happens now. So Thomas, when Jesus confronts Thomas, as we just read, he goes, my Lord and my God, he realizes it is Jesus. He realizes he is the Christ. He really realizes that he's the risen son of God. And here's where I want to make an appeal to all of you who are watching or listening. Um, almost always when um, people talk about the Apostle Thomas, they call him Doubting Thomas, and that's how he's remembered, and this incident is remembered. And here, over 2,000 later, years later, the poor man is still called Doubting Thomas. And I want you to know that history tells us, history tells us that Thomas became a very powerful, very outspoken, one of the great apostles who actually gave his life for his faith. And we think a lot of his influence was in India. He went to India, but he ended up dying for his faith. So here, not only did he overcome his doubt and become a great apostle, he even gave his life for his faith. So it's a bum rap to call him Doubting Thomas. For those of you who are Red Sox fans, it reminds me of poor Billy Buckner. Billy Buckner was a great hitter, a great ball player, an all-star, a lifetime 300 hitter, I believe, and 
Um, yet, when anybody says Billy Buckner, oh, he's the one that let the ball go through his legs in the World Series and cost us the game and all that, well, <laughs> the guy, it's a bum rap. Let's look at the good that was done by Thomas, as we should look at the good that was done by Billy Buckner. Not, I'm, I'm not equating the importance of the two, but the principle is the same. Thomas died for his faith, and he was a great apostle. So um, the emphasis here is reinforcement. For those who doubt, for those who have weak faith, perhaps some listening have that. I've gone through doubts. I've had times of weak faith. Uh, I've had times when I question, but Jesus rose again so that we could overcome those doubts and uh, that we can have faith and still be realistic and logical and, 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 and to pray with faith and to say to the Lord, as was said in Mark 9, 24, it was said to, um, uh, 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 by the man who was um, praying there, he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. In other words, I have some faith, Lord, but strengthen my faith. I believe, but help my unbelief. And so the example to us here in this incident with Thomas is strength from weakness. The Lord says, for example, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says that, that our strength is found, our, his strength is found in our weakness. When we are weak, he is strong. And so Thomas realized that where he was weak, he became strong. And the Lord gave him strength to be a great apostle and a martyr. So he proved that even those of weak faith, even those who doubt, even those who question sometimes, can become great servants of Christ if they let the risen Christ grip their hearts. So even if you've had doubts, even if you've stumbled, even if you've had times of weak faith, take heart because the risen Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ rose so that you will have strength, so that you can finish strong, so that you can have a strong faith and your weakness will be overcome by his strength. He died for us. He died to give us strength. And when Jesus died and we couldn't see him, we can live for him by faith now. And so Christ died and rose to give new life to those who have doubted. Oh, I'm so encouraged by that, and I hope you are too. If you've had weak faith, we can be encouraged because Christ died and rose to give new life to those who have doubted. Now, we want to finish up with the appearance to James, which we find in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. And I'm going to read that as well, because it's just one sentence, and it says, uh, then he appeared, speaking of Jesus, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So much like that special, uh, remember last week we talked about the special appearance to Peter. We're not told any details. It was a private one-on-one -on -one appearance to Peter. It's mentioned twice in scripture, but we don't know anything about it. But we speculated and we used the basis of how he restored Peter in John 21. By the way, I owe you all an apology because I said we were going to look at that this week. And in looking at it, it's so, it's so rich, I decided we'll look at it next week and we'll build the message around that appearance on the beach to Peter when he was restored. But for now, we see there's appearance, that appearance to Peter that we talked about last week. And now we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, that he had a special appearance to James. And we don't know anything about it. Um, it's just mentioned here. And again, I think it's because of a private. He wanted it to be private. And I'm going to explain that why now. Because the events are these. Uh, James was Jesus' half-brother. You see, we know that Jesus had no biological father because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. But Mary and Joseph had children afterwards, 
And one of those was James. And so James is actually Jesus' half-brother. They have the same mom, but they have a different father in that Jesus didn't have a biological father, but Joseph was the biological father of James. And so they grew up in the same household, and um, James sat at the same table with Jesus, played in the same yard, they went to the same places, they probably both worked in Joseph's carpentry shop, and they had probably close to 30 years sharing a daily life, but incredibly, James did not believe. James did not believe. He grew up in the same household, and he didn't believe. And he was with Jesus, played with Jesus, interacted with Jesus, his brother, his half-brother, but he didn't believe. We don't know exactly why. We know one thing, that James was a devout Hebrew. Uh, he was a devout Jew. Um, but of course, Jesus followed Judaism himself devoutly. But I think it's more likely, and you, some of you can relate to this. If you were like me, I was one of four. I happened to have been the oldest of four. Um, and uh, I, was, <laughs> I was one of the most unruly in the family. Um, and maybe James was jealous of Jesus' perfection. Can you imagine what it would be like to grow up with somebody that was totally perfect? He never sinned, never said a nasty word, never had a bad thought, never hurt anybody, never had to stand in the corner, uh, you know, never had to have time out because he never did anything wrong. Can you imagine growing up with somebody that never did anything wrong? I know my siblings didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was obvious that I did things wrong. But if you have to grow up with somebody that's perfect, that's going to cause jealousy and resentment and discomfort probably. Perhaps that's why James didn't believe. We don't know. But I think probably Jesus appeared to him privately because James was in a special category. He was the half-brother of Jesus, and probably there was bad feeling from James towards Jesus in many ways all those years. So Jesus wanted to give him uh, that special appearance. And so G G Jesus lovingly made, special, made a special, private, post-resurrection appearance to James. And here's what happened after that. From being a skeptic from being an unbeliever who grew up with Jesus, he became a mighty believer. He became the great pillar of the church, the great human pillar of the church. He was the leader at the church at Jerusalem. And so he went from skeptic, from doubter, from unbeliever to a great believer and a great spiritual leader of the movement that Jesus started with his resurrection. Can you imagine that? Why would James change like that? Why would he change from being a skeptic and being a doubter and probably being resentful and jealous to loving Jesus and serving him with all his heart? Why would he change? And the answer is right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, because he saw Jesus alive. He saw the resurrected Christ he believed, oh, now it makes sense. He's the son of God. And now I can see why he was perfect. And I can see why he lived a perfect life. He's the risen Christ. He's the risen savior. He's the Messiah. And I believe. And that's what he was. He saw him risen. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because I strongly suspect that there are those watching or listening to this message who grew up with Jesus, so to speak, but never really believed and made a commitment. I believe there are those listening uh, or watching on television 
I believe there are those who grew up knowing all about Jesus. You learned about Jesus in Sunday school or you learned about it in church. Your parents taught you and you sort of grew up with Jesus in that sense, not as a brother uh, like James did, but you grew up with Jesus, knowing about him, hearing about him, but you never really believed and you never really made a commitment. Um, and that's where you fall short. And I'm praying that if you're in that situation, that you will make that decision, that you will make that commitment. And you, and you say to yourself, well, I, I grew up hearing and I grew up learning and I, I went to Sunday school and I went to church camp perhaps, but I never made a decision. Maybe you resisted, maybe you criticized, maybe you opposed with uh, for years, maybe you made excuses, or maybe you just said, no, this isn't important to me one way or the other, and you just sort of let it ride. But you must decide. The single most important decision you can make in life is the decision to believe that Jesus is your personal Savior, that he died on the cross for you, that he gloriously rose from the dead, and you take him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. You commit your life to him. You say, I believe. I want to serve him. I'm committed to him. And you say, Lord Jesus, take over my life. Oh, that's glorious. And that's what you must do because there's, no, there's kind of no middle ground. You either have made a commitment to Jesus or you haven't. Perhaps you grew up with him. Perhaps you heard all about him, but you never said, hey, this affects me. I've got to make a decision. He died for me. You have to see it personally. He died on the cross for your sins personally. And he rose again from the dead for you personally to give you new life. And then you must decide and you must take him into your heart. So the example is to us who already know the Lord is that we need to submit to being changed by the Lord. Jesus Christ changes lives, even mine, even yours. The risen Christ changes lives, even yours and even mine. So we need to let him change us in the ways that we need to be changed. We need to let his resurrection power change our lives to empower us to become mighty servants of Christ. We need to let others see the reality of Jesus in our lives as Jesus let those people in those days, including his half-brother James, let them see the reality of the risen Christ. Oh, I hope you'll do that. It's the most important decision of your life. Don't put it off. If you've grown up with Jesus but never really committed to him, now is the time. James is your example. He grew up with him day by day, moment by moment, and didn't believe until he saw the resurrection. So I'm here to tell you that Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed, and that he died and rose to give you, not, you new life who have grown up with Jesus but never committed. I'll give your life to him. God bless you and thank you for watching. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Oh yes, come to the light, tis shining. Oh